Sudar says he started his career as a soldier young, at 12 to be precise. By 18, he was a platoon commander in the Tamil Tigers guerrilla army, fighting a bitter civil war in Sri Lanka, in which more than 50,000 have died. It's the United Nations Children's Fund Year of the Child in Conflict, and to mark the event, the Michelle Report, written by Nelson Mandela's new wife, Grasa, has highlighted the sad phenomenon of children pressed into the profession of war. Sue Lloyd Roberts has been behind the front line in Sri Lanka and begins her report in Jaffna in search of the child soldiers. The government takes every precaution with the few journalists it allows into Sri Lanka's war zones. All news from the area is carefully controlled. The visitor is hemmed in by military minders from the point of hitching a lift on a troop carrier into one of the disputed areas to then being provided with a military escort throughout. No one's taking any chances. Although the Jaffna Peninsula was allegedly liberated after heavy bombardment by government troops three years ago, the area is still regarded as hostile. Only half the Tamil population of a million who fled the bombing have returned to the few houses which remain, and Tamil tigers still control the country to the south. Government soldiers are now coping with a more sinister threat from the enemy's children. School, the leaders came to our school when I was 13 and said we had to join their army in order to rescue our country. I was trained in laying landmines, operating machine guns and pistols. After three months, I was sent on my first operation. It was an attack on an army checkpoint and I was equipped with grenades. The victims of these attacks are all too evident at the military hospital. This man lost his leg just hours earlier. Soldiers are regularly injured by landmines and booby trap bombs, which they say are often placed by the Tamil's child bombers, who slip in and out of government-controlled areas with ease. I was shown a suicide jacket wired to two kilos of explosives, like the type which had been used by a child a week before, to deadly effect. Tamils have been employing children in their army for at least seven years. BBC cameras were allowed to film these recruits in 1991. Many of the children were orphans who were told that it was their duty to avenge their parents who died for the cause. Children as young as 10 were told it was an honor to die fighting for the LTTE, the freedom fighters who claim a homeland which they call Tamil Elam. But there was an outcry when these pictures were shown of cyanide tablets being handed out to girls at the military graduation ceremony. And since then, the LTTE has been less keen on publicizing its teenage army. But from those who've been captured, the government believe there are now 2,000 children under 18 fighting with the Tamil Tigers. Rojana joined when she was 13 and was one of a unit of 600 children. She was injured during an attack on an army position a few weeks ago and has been charged with the murder of two soldiers. There were 13 and 14 year olds in my unit. If I died, I was told that my parents would be given some money or if my parents died before me, I would be given a higher rank after my death as a posthumous award. Something you wanted to join. Soldar Ali says he was recruited at 12. By the time he was captured at 18, he commanded a platoon of 20 younger children. When I was at school, I never thought about the fighting, but once I joined up, I knew I had to drive out the enemy and fight for a separate homeland. They told us that if we were caught, we were not to be taken alive, we must take our cyanide so we would not be tortured and betray any secrets. When they came and got me, I was asleep. A younger boy was keeping guard and he let me down. If I had known I was to be captured, I would have taken the cyanide for sure. The Sri Lankan government here in Colombo, whose political negotiations with the Tamils have reached stalemate, have seized upon the use of children in the LTTE army for its propaganda value. They say it shows the lack of morality among the Tamil freedom fighters and their desperation. One of the most infamous acts attributed to the LTTE children was this attack on the Navy off Trincomalee three years ago. 
The army arrested a number of child soldiers after the event and filmed their interrogations. The government was keen that I should talk with two girl soldiers who were 15 and 17 at the time of the incident and invited me to meet with them at the central prison in Colombo. But despite being encouraged by the prison authorities, the girls refused to talk to me. The foreign minister is keen to drive home the negative image of the LTTE provided by these children. It reminds me and my generation very much of what happened to German youth under Hitler towards the end of the world, Second World War. You remember in um, the closing stages of the war, Hitler was recruiting teenagers, I mean, boys as young as 13 and 14, and there were those pathetic photographs of them. Does this mean, do you think the LTTE are on their uppers? They are drawing to an end of their resources? It's pretty clear that they are running short of people. Unless you're running short of people, why do you conscript people forcibly? Um, if you had masses of volunteers cheerfully going to war for you, you don't have to conscript little children and kidnap them and pick them up from the gates of schools and so on. But on the Jaffna Peninsula, there are no signs of the rebuilding and the lessening of tension which might be expected of a war nearing its end or of a government in control. It takes 30,000 troops to maintain an uneasy peace here. The present Sri Lankan government came to power four years ago with a promise of talks and even compromise with the Tamils. But onlookers, like the Bishop of Jaffna, says, even with the army minders listening in, that peaceful negotiations are no longer on the government's political agenda. This is what the position of the people here in Jaffna. And also, uh, almost all the Tamil people in the North Indies would say that. The government is not putting enough efforts, uh, like similar to the effort they are putting in the war. All effort at negotiation has been stalled. Even the peace package, the, the government was uh, talking about that. Now nobody speaks about it. The army say they're now employed on a hearts and minds campaign to win over local Tamils and encourage thousands more to return to government controlled areas. When I tried to ask people about whether the army was succeeding, no one seemed to want to talk to me with my minder in tow. The Tamils, who make up an eighth of the population, claim one third of Sri Lanka, an area which includes much of the island's north and eastern coastline. Three years ago, the LTTE forces held 20% of the island, but after the fall of Jaffna and the areas around Trincomalee and Batikalo to the Sri Lankan army, the government claim they've taken back about half that territory. On the east coast, pockets of land pass from one side to the other with some regularity, and hearing there might be a chance to get behind LTTE lines and talk freely to Tamils, I headed that way. A ferry ride from Trincomalee past the naval port attacked by the two girls brings you to the part of the island outside government control which it euphemistically calls Sri Lanka's uncleared areas, which are strictly out of bounds to journalists. The army still controls the main roads into the rebel area, so a Tamil sympathizer showed me an alternative route to avoid the army checkpoints. I was told to hurry. The LTTE troops don't like journalists here either, but they'd withdrawn to join the fighting in the south which left a chance to visit the Tamils here before the Sri Lankan army attempted to move in. The only other traffic here are the heads of families going to collect monthly supplies of rice and sugar from government-controlled areas. The government issues the rations to underline the fact that these people are Sri Lankans wherever they live. But government largesse ends there. I was told there are no hospitals or medical facilities. If someone falls ill, they must wait for the monthly visit by the International Red Cross. Life in these LTTE-held areas is more difficult than anywhere else on this island which has been impoverished by war. The government says people only stay here because they're intimidated. But, in fact, the LTTE army left this area a week ago to fight a campaign further south, but they'll be back. The people here say they'll stay because this is all they have to call their Tamil homeland and they'll use their children when necessary to defend it. 
The formal and starched school children are the only hint of normality in these areas. The headmaster recalls with pride how, a few years back, his O-level class carried on with their exams while the war raged around the school. I had been told that when the LTTE recruiting officers address a school in the uncleared areas, up to 50% of the pupils leave to join up, and most of the children here told me they'd been approached. They ask for one person from each family. As my brother had already joined up, I was excused. My father was shot by the Sinhalese army, and my brother was killed fighting for the LTTE. Because we have a martyr in the family, the recruiting officer said, I'm allowed to study. From time to time, the LTTE come to the school and say they want to hold a meeting. I don't say yes, but I can't say no. We have to agree because we don't want problems. What can I do? People here are afraid of the LTTE, but they want Tamil Alam. In one of the bombed out houses in the village, I met a local recruiting officer who had been left behind to recruit more children while the army was away fighting. Hundreds of our temples have been attacked. Our people are not free and we are continually harassed by the authorities and our homes are raided. It is this that drives people to support the Tigers. You accuse the Sri Lankan authorities of human rights abuses and yet the LTTE and its supporters condone the use of children as soldiers. How do you defend that? It is not the Tigers who are recruiting young people. It is the government who are driving the young people to the Tigers. For example, when a young person loses a parent, they feel great anger, and they vent this anger by joining the Tigers, and so fighting back against the atrocities which have been committed against them. The war against the Tamils is costing the Sri Lankan government an estimated 10 million pounds a week. And every time one of the Tamil Tiger suicide bombers hits targets in the capital Colombo, or like earlier this year in one of the main tourist resorts, millions more are lost in tourist revenue. Now, in addition to coping with the landmine amputees and widespread malnutrition in the hospitals which border the war zones, doctors are preparing to cope with hundreds of psychologically traumatized children on a scale never seen before. The man who's been put in charge admits he hasn't got the resources to cope. <laughs> the scars are very deep, and there have been long-term consequences of uh, uh, severe aggression, sleeplessness, uh, addiction to drugs, uh, and uh, also um, obsession to see blood and so on. So the, the long-term sequences are very much so like in any other form of abuse, such as sexual abuse or physical abuse for that matter. They fed me with false propaganda. They gave me wrong ideas. I had to stay with them. I want to enjoy life and go home, but now I'm charged with murder. While I was fighting with the LTTE, I was happy. I joined them because I wanted to. I have no regrets. Nor, it appears, do the vast majority of his contemporaries have regrets. The war has displaced some one million people. Many of them are living in refugee camps. But at this one, near Jaffna, teenage children are notably missing, despite the guards at the gate to prevent potential recruits from leaving. There's no end in sight to the war in Sri Lanka, and until there is, another generation of Tamils stand to lose their childhood. Rojana joined when she was 13 and was one of a unit of 600 children. She was injured during an attack on an army position a few weeks ago and has been charged with the murder of two soldiers. There were 13 and 14 year olds in my unit. If I died, I was told that my parents would be given some money or if my parents died before me, I would be given a higher rank after my death as a posthumous award. Something you wanted to join? Soldar Ali says he was recruited at 12. By the time he was captured at 18, he commanded a platoon of 20 younger children. When I was at school, I never thought about the fighting, but once I joined up, I knew I had to drive out the enemy and fight for a separate homeland. They told us that if we were caught, we were not to be taken alive, but must take our cyanide 
so we would not be tortured and betray any secrets. When they came and got me, I was asleep. A younger boy was keeping guard and he let me down. If I had known I was to be captured, I would have taken the cyanide for sure. The Sri Lankan government here in Colombo, whose political negotiations with the Tamils have reached stalemate, have seized upon the use of children in the LTTE army for its propaganda value. They say it shows the lack of morality among the Tamil freedom fighters and their desperation. One of the most infamous acts attributed to the LTTE children was this attack on the Navy off Trincomalee three years ago. The army arrested a number of child soldiers after the event and filmed their interrogations. The government was keen that I should talk with two girl soldiers who were 15 and 17 at the time of the incident and invited me to meet with them at the central prison in Colombo. But despite being encouraged by the prison authorities, the girls refused to talk to me. The foreign minister is keen to drive home the negative image of the LTTE provided by these children. It reminds me and my generation very much of what happened to Germany. Suda says he started his career as a soldier young, at 12 to be precise. By 18, he was a platoon commander in the Tamil Tigers guerrilla army, fighting a bitter civil war in Sri Lanka in which more than 50,000 have died. It's the United Nations Children's Fund Year of the Child in Conflict, and to mark the event, the Michelle Report, written by Nelson Mandela's new wife, Grasa, has highlighted the sad phenomenon of children pressed into the profession of war. Sue Lloyd Roberts has been behind the front line in Sri Lanka and begins her report in Jaffna in search of the child soldiers. The government takes every precaution with the few journalists it allows into Sri Lanka's war zones. All news from the area is carefully controlled. The visitor is hemmed in by military minders, from the point of hitching a lift on a troop carrier into one of the disputed areas, to then being provided with a military escort throughout. No one controlled areas with ease. I was shown a suicide jacket wired to two kilos of explosives, like the type which had been used by a child a week before to deadly effect. The Tamils have been employing children in their army for at least seven years. BBC cameras were allowed to film these recruits in 1991. Many of the children were orphans who were told that it was their duty to avenge their parents who died for the cause. Children as young as 10 were told it was an honor to die fighting for the LTTE, the freedom fighters who claim a homeland which they call Tamil Elam. But there was an outcry when these pictures were shown of cyanide tablets being handed out to girls at their military graduation ceremony. And since then, the LTTE has been less keen on publicizing its teenage army. But from those who've been captured, the government believe there are now 2,000 children under 18 fighting with the Tamil Tigers. It's taking any chances. Although the Jaffna Peninsula was allegedly liberated after heavy bombardment by government troops three years ago, the area is still regarded as hostile. Only half the Tamil population of a million who fled the bombing have returned to the few houses which remain, and Tamil tigers still control the country to the south. Government soldiers are now coping with a more sinister threat from the enemy's children. The leaders came to our school when I was 13 and said we had to join their army in order to rescue our country. I was trained in laying landmines, operating machine guns and pistols. After three months, I was sent on my first operation. It was an attack on an army checkpoint and I was equipped with grenades. The victims of these attacks are all too evident at the military hospital. This man lost his leg just hours earlier. Soldiers are regularly injured by landmines and booby trap bombs, which they say are often placed by the Tamil's child bombers who slip in and out of government control.